because future looking statements are inherently subject to risk and uncertainty, our reminder is that you should make any purchasing decisions or investment decisions based on products that are currently commercially available. Hello everyone. Welcome to the Trailhead DX Highlights webinar. I'm really excited about what Satya and Aditya are going to do to deliver the amazing content that was delivered at Trailhead DX. At Trailhead DX, the event was amazing. We started with the main show or keynote where there were some great announcements. Outside of that, we had four different channels where the developer, admin, architect, as well as a community ecosystem channel. Each of these channels had some great cream of the crop topics that were covered. Besides that, we had about 50 plus demos that were uh, available in two to three minute bite-sized pieces where you were able to go there uh, and view them and then get your questions answered by our experts. As you can see, Trail DX had some amazing content and I'm so excited about Aditya and Satya who are going to deliver a summary of this content for you so that you can really zoom into things that are exciting for you. After this webinar, I encourage you to go to trailheaddx.com where you will be able to go deeper into the content that's shared today. You'll be able to watch all the different episodes, watch the demos, and then get your questions answered through the community. So with that, let's welcome Aditya and Satya and happy learning from Cody and I. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone, whether you're joining us live or watching the recording. My name is Aditya. I'm a senior developer evangelist here at Salesforce. All of you know Cody. Cody says hi. And today I'm joined by my colleague Satya. Hey Satya. Thank you for sharing this Cody with me, Aditya. It looks so awesome. Looks like Cody lost a ton of weight in two seconds. Cody, what's your diet plan? That's interesting. Satya, maybe we should try it sometime. <laughs> Hello everyone, my name is Satya and I am also a developer evangelist at Salesforce and today Aditya and I are going to walk you through the highlights of the first ever virtual trailhead DX and we are going to do that in just 45 minutes. So how do we get started Aditya? The same way we start all of our events with our trailblazers. Thank you all for making trailhead DX a huge success. Now let's see what some of our trailblazers think of the virtual experience. I've been going to TDX since the very first year and to be honest, uh, I'd much prefer seeing everybody in person, but uh, given the environment we're in, I think the next evolution of TDX to a virtual experience really did a great job of bringing as much of that in-person feel to the virtual experience as possible. Attending virtual Trailhead DX is not same as watching a recording. It's a social experience. A good analogy is the difference between watching recorded sports and watching it live on TV. It's not same as going to the stadium, but you still feel alive. You still feel the energy and the connection with everyone else watching it with you. Hello. So how did I find the experience in comparison to the in-person? Well, I've been working with distributed teams for years. And to me, being distributed doesn't mean being dispersed. So it was a great virtual event. Maybe next time we could bring a layer of virtual reality, like a video game. You know, I'm a big fan of games. So we can mingle that way with the community. I think the new trailer DX experience, which was completely remote um, is right for this time and I think it's the future. One of the things that I really loved about it is that I could go and attend multiple sessions at the whim without running around the whole place and I could do it at the comfort of my home. So I am all in for the new remote experience um, and hopefully um, you liked it as well. What I liked most about Trailhead DX was the fact that there was no barriers to entry People from around the world could join. And we had thousands of people right there watching the same content with the chat right next to it. So we were all able to experience something much bigger 
and to some extent more interactive than if we had a smaller group of people sitting in a room. I really enjoyed how social the sessions were. I remember Sarah retweeting one of my tweets and I was like, isn't she supposed to give the keynote in few minutes? Also how interactive the sessions were, circle of success especially. You could just type in your questions and have them answer in the session itself. What did I like the most of the virtual experience? Well, the flexible schedule that I didn't have to commute and basically I could watch and consume and digest all the content from my sofa on the TV. What I liked about the virtual experience is that you get to choose um, the events and the sessions that you wanted to go to. Um, you are not missing a one session over the other just because it's far apart. So for me, sitting at the comfort of my home, in the middle of the night for that matter, uh, I was able to switch from an architect session uh, to a developer session to a community session and also make it in time for the, uh, the fireside chat with Trevor Noah. So for me, um, being anywhere and still accessing the content uh, is the next level in the new normal. So I really appreciate how the uh, virtual side of things have been really well incorporated into this Trail DX. It's really awesome to hear from them that they loved it. You know what I loved? Jennifer Hudson's amazing voice. Sun in the sky. What a great start to the event. What about you, Aditya? My favorite part of the event was the one thing that only the people who joined us live could experience, the chat window. It was super fun looking at all the kinds of messages that were flowing in. At first, it was just hi from so-and-so city name, but then at one point we were bombarded with a lot of LinkedIn profile URLs. Some people did not like that. Yes, that's so true. One of the perks of in-person events is networking. And that is one thing I feel the virtual event was little missing. Hope we'll come up with creative ways for this next time. Okay, so now let's talk about the latest and greatest announcements and start the 45 minutes time. Okay, so first up is the keynote updates. The one feature that everyone was excited about, Salesforce Anywhere. Salesforce Anywhere helps you experience Salesforce in a whole new way with a chat first experience. You can subscribe to alerts and be notified across desktop and mobile device. It allows you to collaborate in context, which means you can message and share Salesforce data with individuals and groups with chat, voice and video embedded right within your business process. Lastly, it allows you to take action in the moment and take suggested actions based on artificial intelligence. Let's look at a demo. We are in the brand new Salesforce Anywhere mobile app. You can start your day by looking at the messages you have. Next, you can go to the alerts tab to look at the alerts on the records that you have subscribed to. Now to subscribe to new records, you can go to the subscriptions tab. This tab shows you all the records that you have subscribed to and you can click on any one of them to manage your subscription preferences or click the plus icon to subscribe to new records. Let's click on the Aneco and Force Automotive subscription. You'll see that I've subscribed to two records, one being Aneco and the other being Force Automotive. So you'll get notified whenever something you specify changes. Here, I've selected a lot of fields. For example, I'm going to receive an alert whenever the opportunity value changes. Once you receive an alert, you can share the results with your team over chat. In the chat, they'll get to see all the relevant details of the record. And this is governed by the permissions in Salesforce, which means you can only see the fields and records that you have access to. Now, what's our general tendency when we get added to groups? Mute them. And Salesforce Anywhere allows you to do that as well. You can manage your notification preferences for specific chats. Now let's switch over to the desktop experience. 
A new icon on the top right allows you to get to your chats, which offers the same seamless experience. You can also attach relevant records and continue the conversation. My impressions, I tried it and I loved it. But I thought the name was a little bit misleading at first. I mean, even today with a browser or the mobile app, I can access Salesforce from anywhere. So a better name could be Salesforce Messenger. I don't know, but that's just me. Speaking of change in the name, Satya, do you want to cover the next feature? Yes, Salesforce Evergreen is now called Salesforce Functions and it is the latest addition to the Salesforce platform. What are Salesforce functions? In simple words, it is function as a service offerings. In short, we can call it as FAS. It gives you the ability to write custom code in the language of your choice and run it on demand and at scale on the cloud. Functions can be built using open source programming languages like Java or not leveraging the libraries from NPM. You can read and write data in your Salesforce org from within your functions and develop it using CLI or the VS Code extension for Salesforce. Let's look into a simple use case demonstrated in the keynote. We are currently in contact record page where we can upload the financial documents related to this account. Since the documents are highly sensitive, when we upload them, we want to add watermark to this image. How can we do that? Since Node supports open source libraries and we have libraries that support image manipulation, we'll use one of those to build a Node Salesforce function for the image manipulation functionality. Let's have a look at the code. Here I'm in the VS Code project and we'll see how we can add the watermark functionality. Here we are using GIMP watermark library. We can get the contact document ID from the incoming platform event and we can use the helper routine to add the watermark functionality to the last file that was uploaded. Finally, we can grab the new version of the image and attach it to the contact and write this update back to the Salesforce org. Let's test it locally by invoking a mock function against the data in our scratch org. Let's see what happened. When we go back to the org, you can now see the new image and when you click that, you can see the confidential watermark on it. Now let's see how it works in production by invoking the function from flows. Here we are in the flow builder where we have implemented the flow which automatically calls the function when a new document is uploaded. Let's activate that flow. Now let's go back to the contact and upload a new file and see what happens. It automatically creates the watermark version of the file which is created by our function and it is the same function that we have built and tested locally and now it is live in our org. This was a simple use case. You can think of more complex use cases and build it. I'm a fan of Node.js since five years. I'm excited that the skill will be useful in Salesforce as well. I know DevOps excites developers, but what about admins? For admins, we launched the DevOps Center. The DevOps Center is a central application to be delivered with a new DevOps solution. This first version will include an improved UI based experience around change and release management. That will do two things. First, it will deliver a modern and robust experience for declarative developers and admins. And second, it will allow for collaboration between declarative and programmatic developers throughout the DevOps process. Let's look at a demo. This is the work items tab of the DevOps Center. Here you can see a list of work items, which are like tickets that define the requirements of whatever change that you're making. Now the work item is a central object in the entire flow as it is the one that actually tracks all of the changes that you make and tie them together and move them through the release process. Let's click on a work item. Now the work item status is shown as in progress, which means you can start making the changes for this particular work item. You can click on the launch dev environment button and it will open the developer sandbox where you can do your development. And this sandbox 
is synchronized with the source from the connected source control repo. Let's make a few changes. Let's go to the app page and add a new component, purely a declarative change. And click on save. Now back in the DevOps center, you can click on the pull changes button to pull the changes that we just made in the sandbox. So people who are already familiar with the SFDX commands, this does the equivalent of SFDX for source pull without you having to explicitly write that command. Now this is super handy because you don't need to keep track of all the changes that you've made manually. Now, once your changed files have been pulled, you still have the ability to decide which of these you really want to migrate forward in the process. Now, once you've made all your selections, let's add a description, comment, and submit the changes. The work item automatically moves to the in review stage of the flow. And what happens behind the scenes is the tool is going to commit and push all the metadata into a branch in the connected repository. And it's also going to create a pull request. And all of this, you don't need to worry about any GitHub commands. You don't need to remember any of those. The tool is going to take care of that. The process from here on is going to be managed manually, uh, which means your developers are going to commit their own code to the repo. And it's a manual process to move things forward to the connected sandboxes and so on and so forth. And this is the first version that we're going to release. I think this is very much in line with Salesforce's motto of no software. I mean, two years back when the whole developer experience on the desktop was launched, I saw some criticism around that, um, saying that it was not in line with Salesforce's motto. But with the launch of Code Builder and the DevOps Center, I think uh, those people will be happy that things are back on route. As Kavindra said, after the keynote, we had four tracks running in parallel with around eight sessions each. First, let's talk about the updates from the developer track. Let's start with Apex updates. Apex is the solution for code on Salesforce platform. It is first released in 2006 and it has backward compatibility. What does that mean? If you would have written code in 2006 and you are executing the code on the latest Salesforce platform, it still executes. Coming in winter, we are adding a new language operator that exposes special behavior for null handling and it handles any Apex step, be it a variable, property or method calls. Our new safe navigation operator ensures that if the left side of the expression is not null, then the code does whatever dot would do. This is the Apex class which gets the partition dynamically from platform cache. Here we are checking conditions like partition doesn't exist using null check. And then we are fetching the data and handle another null check to see whether the data has come properly or not. Now let's see how the same code looks like when we use safe navigation operator. You can see that we handle all the null checks in a single line using safe navigation operator. To learn more, don't miss to watch the demo in the Apex session. One more feature that was showed in the session and currently in open palette is Apex finalizers. Finalizers solve one of the biggest pain points with asynchronous code, making sure asynchronous code is executed in order. You can watch the session recording to see how Kevin has built and ordered the promises using finalizers. The next update is about Einstein language and Einstein vision APIs, which are two of our primary focus areas. Let's first check the updates in Einstein language. We have two new features with summer 20 release. The first is support of multi-language feature. Now we have five additional European languages French, Italian, German, Portuguese, and Spanish. And the second one is a new Einstein language service called Einstein NER, which stands for Name Entity Recognition. With NER, customers can recognize different entities such as name, location, date and time in a body of text, and handle use cases like extract 
travel booking details such as location and dates from an email. Now let's get into what's new with Einstein Vision. In the summer 20 release, one biggest news is Einstein OCR, Optical Character Recognition. It makes data entry a thing of the past by allowing you to extract text from any image. Examples of OCR coming to life is scanning business cards at events to get contacts into your system at scale. Or you can even automate loan verification by analyzing custom documents and scan patient referral forms in the health space and many more such examples. What's great about the OCR API is it's already a pre-trained global model. You don't need to upload a data set to train the data. All you need to do is upload whatever image you want and it's smart enough to extract the text for you. Not just the Einstein APIs, but the general API ecosystem in Salesforce got a few updates. We are helping you do more with less API calls with a new composite API and the composite graph API. With the composite API, you can make one call with up to 25 sub requests and roll back the entire transaction if there are any errors. This is a sample request with multiple sub requests. To process related objects, you can use the reference ID and pass it along to the child object. With the composite API, you can also hit the query and describe endpoints. The graph API is the latest addition to the composite family, which is designed for optimal processing of CRUD operations on related S objects. With this, you can assemble a complicated and a complete graph of related records. However, you won't be able to run the describe or query operations. Let's look at a request. We have an array of graphs where each graph object is a composite request that has a complete description of the parent record and all the child records. For a more detailed explanation of these APIs, please watch the session recordings on trailheadex.com. We are helping you reduce friction by allowing you to exceed the daily API limit without service interruptions. And we are also making it easy to track request volumes over a 30 day period. And finally, we are introducing the SOCL fields function to return a predefined column grouping. For example, to fetch all the fields, you just need to say fields of all. This will return all the fields, including the system audit fields. To get only the custom fields, you can specify fields of custom. As you can see, this has only returned the custom fields. Next, there was a wonderful session on the Lightning web stack which essentially covered all the five layers of the stack and showed you how you can build and run your apps anywhere. The Lightning web stack provides important modules and services to build a trusted web app that can run anywhere. First, your code needs to be modular and open, which is where you can use Lightning web components built on modern web standards. We've also open sourced some of our base lightning components so that you don't have to start from scratch. Next, the Salesforce lightning design system provides all the patterns and blueprints you need to design pixel perfect apps. The second part of building apps is making it secure. You can leverage lightning services like lightning locker that comes out of the box with lightning web components. And finally, making your code portable. The Lightning data service makes it easy to access Salesforce data and also includes powerful client-side caching technology. The Lightning web runtime makes it really easy to develop locally on your machine or build your apps to run on any platform. With the combination of the Lightning web runtime and the open source base Lightning components, you can now build and run your apps anywhere. We launched LWC last year and since then we saw many interesting updates with which 
the developers can productively build applications using modern web standards. We also equip developers with easy to learn resources, reference code through sample projects and tools to easily build LWC applications. Many of you might already be knowing Sample Gallery, where you can find reference code. We are currently in Sample Gallery and you can see a bunch of applications here. My favorite is Recipe app and you can find bite-sized examples for each of the LWC concepts in this app. The latest addition to the Sample Gallery is Visual Force to LWC. VF to LWC app is a collection of code examples to help you move from Visual Force to LWC. Each example shows a typical Visual Force pattern and its equivalent implementation in LWC. Let's see an example here. I have already deployed the Visual Force to LWC by following the steps in the README of the repository. You can also follow the Quick Start Guide, which is recently added to the trailhead to understand and easily deploy the application. Here, you can see bite-sized examples implemented both in Visual Force and LWC. For instance, if you see the page block example, it is implemented using the equivalent components in LWC like lighting card, lighting layout and lighting layout item. You can view the Visual Force source code in the repository using this link. You can also see the equivalent LWC source for the component with this link. You can also check out the code into your development environment and start using it. Each of the tabs has related examples grouped together. You can explore more by deploying it yourself. Don't miss to watch the LWC demo in the demo section of the Terrahead DX site. Last but not the least, update of this channel, which is my favorite, Code Builder. Let's first see how we work on projects in VS Code. I'm in VS Code and working on a property filter component. I can see some errors there with red squiggles and let me fix it. Let's fix the spacing issue with the Prettier plugin by running the command format document from the command palette. Let's save the property filter component and test it. You can click on the beaker icon, select property filter and click play button to run the test. It looks just good, so let's save it. We can now check the component on local development server before deploying it to the sandbox. I can do that but I want to check how my component works in the mobile. Now we can also check the component on mobile emulator right from your VS code. Let's do that. Right click on the property filter component and select preview component locally. We can test it using browser, Android or iOS simulator. Let's test it using iOS simulator. And as I do this, you can see the component in the simulator now. I can interact with it and see how it works. Awesome. We can now deploy it to the sandbox. Now, I wanted to help my friend start working on this project using new Salesforce code builder instead of VS Code. I just opened the code builder where you can see all the workspaces of different projects. Now, let's create a workspace by clicking new workspace and just by giving it a name. In few seconds, Salesforce developer environment will be created. This environment is provisioned with all the developer tools needed to build a Salesforce application like Heroku CLI, Salesforce CLI and the VS Code extensions and everything else to start working. Instead of using the newly created workspace, I can switch over to the one I have already created. Let's open the property filter component and check how this version in my friend's org is different from the version I deployed in the sandbox by using the diff tool. By the way, we are sharing the same sandbox together. I can see the fixes done. Now we can retrieve the difference from the org using retrieve source from the org. We can also retrieve any other components deployed in the sandbox to my development environment in the code builder using the org browser extension. Now, I can create new components as well. With Salesforce Code Builder for the first time, we can now create, test, deploy and debug Lightning components completely in the browser without downloading any software. With Salesforce Code Builder, 
developer can now develop from anywhere and anytime with complete flexibility. That wraps up the developer channel updates. In the admin channel, the first update is about dynamic forms and actions, which happens to be one of the most requested feature on Idea Exchange. Dynamic forms and actions allows you to customize pages by dragging and dropping individual fields onto the layout. Each field behaves like an individual component, which means their visibility can be controlled using the filters on the app builder. Let's look at a demo. To enable dynamic forms, navigate to user interface, record settings, and then activate dynamic forms. Since dynamic forms is currently only available for custom objects, let's navigate to a record page of a custom object. Inside a record page, once you select the record detail, you can see a handy little upgrade wizard on the right hand side that upgrades your current page layouts to dynamic forms. Once you're done, you notice that the UI behavior of individual fields like required or read only is still preserved. You can now move individual fields around or set their visibility using app builders filters. There is a new tab fields, which allows you to add new fields to your page. Irrespective of whether you activate dynamic forms or not, starting summer 20, the structure of the flexi page metadata is going to change. As you can see, the component instance tag is now going to be wrapped inside an item instance tag. And this is to support the new dynamic forms. So those of you who are using version control system as a source of truth, make sure you make this change in your repos because once your org updates to summer 20, you won't be able to deploy flexi pages using the older metadata file anymore. Next, one of my favorite topics, flows. Starting summer 20, you now have the ability to trigger flows on record change or update. You can also trigger a flow whenever a platform event is received. Coming in winter 22 flows is the ability to have multi-column screens. In fact, you can have up to 12 columns, which means you can have multiple fields on the same row, images next to fields or blank columns. To make building flows easier, we launched automation components, which has pre-built components to help you build flows even faster. Let's take a look. To get to automation components, navigate to the sample app gallery and click on the automation components. You'll be taken to a GitHub repo, which includes instructions on how you can use automation components. This is an open source project, so we are open to contributions as well. Finally, you can also check out the community site unofficialsf.com for more automation developer resources. It looks like the flow builder is growing more and more powerful by the day. And in some cases, I heard it's even 10 times faster than process builder. I think that's something to remember when designing solutions. We know that we can set up prompts using in-app guidance, but let's see what's new with summer release. You can now offer multi-step prompts or what we call walkthroughs. Okay, let's see it in action. In-app guidance setup page is much same as in the previous releases. But now you can note that there are walkthroughs in the type of guidance. All right, let's take a look at the existing walkthrough. It launches the first step, which highlights the recently viewed list in the opportunities tab, recommending to pin the list. When you click on next, it navigates into the first record. In this step, it talks about highlights panel for summary information. Click next one more time. It will bring into the details section. And here it's telling that you can go ahead and make some changes. Let's do it. Now, when I click next, it navigates to the whole new app and new page. Here we are ending on a doc prompt. 
Here we have a video which can play in line. This allows the user to get the information right from the app. You can also see that we can add action to navigate to a link. Now let's get back to the setup page and see how the walkthrough was created. Let's edit the walkthrough. Notice the new builder in the summer 20 release. There is a right panel, choose the type of the prompt for each step and left, the pa left panel shows each step and rest of the app is running in the middle. And you can just navigate around the app. You can click next in the right panel to define the prompt. And by clicking on each step in the left panel, you can navigate around the walkthrough. You can also easily reorder or add step. And that's it. You can so easily create a walkthrough and all of the guidance is packageable and reportable. Next, let's talk about the new custom offline functionality on Salesforce Mobile. The Salesforce Mobile app has had the offline capability for quite some time, but this takes it a bit further. For people with no connectivity, they need to access data that is unique to their own job function. You can do this by creating something called as an offline briefcase. Briefcases help you define which objects and records will be available offline. Each briefcase has a maximum limit of 2000 records and you can assign a briefcase to individual users or groups depending on what their job functionality is. Let's look at a demo. From setup, navigate to offline and then briefcase. Then click on the new briefcase button to create a new one. Let's give it a name and click next. In the select data screen, let's select an object. Then define the filter criteria. Record scope. Order by. And you'll notice the configuration is pretty much similar to what you find in list views. Once you're done, click next. Here, you can assign this briefcase to users or groups and finally activate it. In Service Cloud, the biggest thing that's going live in Summer 20 is Service Cloud Voice. Coming in the Summer 20 release, Service Cloud Voice offers pre-integrated telephony from Amazon Connect. Customers can now quickly deploy integrated and scalable telephony to Customer 360 service. Service Cloud Voice comes with awesome features like real-time call transcription, recording, and more. Let's look at a quick demo on how to get started. Once you acquire the license, go to Setup and click on Voice Setup. Then enable Service Cloud Voice. Next, you'll need to create a contact center and add users to it. On the Amazon Connect platform, you can define your call routing protocols, voice prompts, IVR, and more. Back in Service Cloud, once a customer places a call, the agents can access it through the omnichannel widget. The agents also can transfer calls, mute calls, or end them from right within the service console. Here is one feature that blew my mind. Using keyword spotting on call transcription records, tools like Einstein Next Best Action can automatically be triggered. Finally, let's talk about Tableau. One of the key takeaways from the Tableau session is that data-driven decisions must always include predictive intelligence as well. And this session in particular shows you how Tableau and Salesforce can be integrated together to achieve this. First, we introduce the Tableau Visualization Lightning Web Component, using which you can embed Tableau dashboards right inside Salesforce. Let's look at a demo. We are in Tableau, where you can create rich visualizations with just clicks. Once your dashboard is ready, you can share it with others using a simple link. Back in Salesforce, let's simply drag and drop the Tableau Lightning Web Component and paste the link that we just copied into the component properties. 
You'll also notice some other properties with which you can control the look and feel of your dashboard. Next, the session also gave an important message that data-driven decisions must include predictive intelligence. I would encourage all of you to go and check out the recording, which basically shows how you can use Einstein discovery to build out a model that predicts something. And this data can be then imported into Tableau using APIs, and then you can build out your visualizations. And that concludes the updates from the admin channel. Over to you, Satya. Now, let's move on to the architect channel. The first update is about the guides that will be useful to implement Customer 360 solutions. The Customer 360 is a powerful set of building blocks that allow your company to build amazing experiences for your customers. You know these connected experiences are critical in this digital first world, but uniting departments around single source of truth is a challenging problem to solve. You need to know how to put those building blocks together to empower your teams to go digital fast and scale with confidence. The good news is you don't have to start from the scratch. We are introducing Customer 360 Guides. It is available today and it is free. Built on the success of many trailblazers, Customer 360 Guides are proven architectures, blueprints and best practices that empower you to achieve your Customer 360. These guides help you to learn from the success of other trailblazers, discover how you can achieve your business goals and it enables you to connect your data and applications from across your technology portfolio to turn your vision into a reality. Our first Customer 360 Guide is all about transforming the consumer experience. Here this guide will show you how B2C companies can deliver seamless connected computer experiences across marketing, commerce and service built around the single source of truth. Here you can learn how to unlock and unify your customer data, how to personalize those digital journeys with your customers and scale services across any channel. Whether you are just getting started or enhancing your digital presence, everyone can navigate their journey. Here you see the digital guide for Transform the consumer experience. You start your journey in a familiar way by taking a trail. This trail gets you an overview of what transforming the consumer experience is all about and why is it important. Now you are ready to learn how other customers have succeeded with transforming the customer experience. You check out a story from Alpine Group, a leading nutritional foods company and read about how their head of digital tackle this challenge for their business. You then explore your business needs with what Salesforce has to offer. You start by familiarizing yourself with the reference architecture which plays a big role in shaping your vision by showing you how Salesforce products and our industry expertise can help you align your departments to achieve your company goals. And with aligned business priorities, you are ready to map your goals to the right solution. Here you see six business scenario recommendations. You identify that customer-centric journeys tie directly into one of your company goals. In diving into this business scenario, you get a brief overview. You see the list of Salesforce products required as well as set of business capabilities and finally a set of solutions recommended in order to achieve this goal. You craft your company's future growth by prioritizing the relevant crawl, walk and run solutions based on your business maturity level. One solution you know your company needs to prioritize right now is personalized marketing recommendations. The personalized marketing recommendations solution kit takes you deeper into, the, into how to connect commerce and marketing cloud together to achieve business value. Now that you know the detailed guidance for the solution, you want to implement it. Succeed. To find out more, please visit us on trailhead at trailhead.salesforce.com slash guides. The next update is about MuleSoft. MuleSoft's API-led approach helps you deliver projects fast and MuleSoft Accelerator helps you move even faster with 40 pre-built integration assets. The developers and architects are most of the times under pressure to deliver the projects fast. And we strive to be faster than the previous project. But when a typical customer transaction crosses 35 systems, Integrating new or legacy systems into our existing technology stack slows us down. 
MuleSoft is the world's number one platform for APIs and integration. MuleSoft makes it easy for you to connect data from any application, device or system, legacy or modern, on-prem or in the cloud, Salesforce or not. How? Integrate your systems with APIs found in MuleSoft API Marketplace or build your own APIs with ease on our unified platform. And when you do build your own, reuse them for the next project and the project after. That's how MuleSoft allows you to deliver your projects fast. With MuleSoft, you can adopt a layered approach to build the integrations. Accelerator is a joint MuleSoft and Salesforce solution that helps you implement critical integrations faster and easier than ever before. Developers can save up to 60% of their implementation time using the Accelerator. Best of all, these assets were synthesized from thousands of customer implementations. So you know you adopted industry best practices and are building in the most efficient way possible. So what assets are included with Accelerator? APIs, integration templates, reference architecture, LWC, and last but not least, common services such as logging, notification, and scheduling. In total, MuleSoft has over 40 assets that cover service cloud and commerce cloud use cases. But any of these assets can be used as is or extended to your unique requirements. In fact, using AnyPoint Studio IDE for building integrations and APIs, you can change these assets using the drag and drop interface or XML configuration experience. If you have missed Trailhead DX live session, don't miss the session demo to learn how to use the accelerator for Commerce Cloud and Service Cloud. The next update is about architectural patterns for data privacy. Here are some patterns that we are seeing in the data privacy space. Consent management, data subject rights, data governance, accessibility and transparency. And all of these concepts tie back to one individual person and how we respect their data within our systems. And to understand this, you must first understand where you are storing this information. In Salesforce, it is typically contacts, leads, and users. The next thing you'll have to check is if we have consent from them to use their data. And users must also have the ability to download their data if they want to. Now, in some cases, not all of the data might be present in Salesforce. So all of the external systems which have users data must be talking to each other to identify the consent parameters. Finally, you also need to track where you got certain data from, why do you need it and for how long. And you must delete data after that particular time. So that's a lot. And here are a few things that Salesforce is going to help you with managing privacy. First, to help you manage consent, we've added privacy and governance objects. In this, the individual object is the core against which we track all of the consent parameters. Since there are a lot of objects, we've made it easier for you to work with these objects by launching the Consent Capture app on App Exchange. This is a Salesforce Labs application, which means it is free to download and use. And this app has a bunch of flow templates that will allow you to view, manage, and create consent records. The next feature that we are launching as a pilot starting August 1st is the Data Privacy Manager, which simplifies all of the things we discussed about privacy management. Using the Data Privacy Manager, you can define a data retention policy that automatically deletes or anonymizes the data based on the criteria that you specify. Next, you can also define portability policies where you can create a data map of the records that the users can download. Finally, the consent event stream that allows you to sync consent information with external systems. And this makes use of platform events. Let's look at a demo. Here is where you can create a new data retention policy. Let's look at one of the policies. First, you can choose how often you want this policy to run. Next, you can choose the objects and decide whether you want to transform them or delete them. You can optionally cache the data as a backup for a certain duration of the time. Define the filter criteria 
and define what you do with the fields. Once you run this policy, you'll notice that it creates a big object in the backend that archives all of the data that you want to cache. Next is a portability policies. Here you can create a data map of all of the data in the system. So you select a parent object. Let's typically say it is a contact. You can click on an object to view its fields and then click on link object to add the related objects of the contact. You can then select the fields that you want to add and save the policy. Now you can invoke this policy using a REST API that returns a JSON based on the data map that you have defined. Finally, the consent event stream. Whenever you change any consent field on the individual object, let's say export individuals data, then a new notification in the event stream will be sent out. Here, you can see that send individuals data is marked as true. Last but not the least of the architect channel, a final update on how you can deliver values in the crisis situation. Some of the things I learned from this session are, you may have to build something quicker. Design need not be perfect, but good enough when you don't have the picture. You may not have the end user accessible in the beginning, but remember that these users ultimately need training and other change management best practices. Consider building the applications mostly with clicks. And that's the wrap of Architects channel. The community and ecosystem channel covered all the incredible innovations on Trailhead like daily reminders on the Trailhead mobile app, recommendations powered by Einstein and more. You can also look at the list of upcoming Trailhead live sessions and add them to the calendar right from within the mobile app. A few sessions in this channel also focused on how you can level up in your career and how the Trailblazer community can help you with this. The Answers tab in the Trailblazer community is a place where you can find all the technical help that you're looking for. Just search for a question. Most probably someone on the other would have already faced a similar issue and would have gotten a response. If not, you can just post your question and people around the globe are literally waiting to answer that. Next, Trailblazer community groups. It's most useful if you want to scale up and network. Search for a community group near your city and look at the events and technical sessions that they're hosting. Given that everything is virtual these days, you need not really be limited by the groups near you. As long as you're comfortable with the time zone, you can go for it. Finally, get career ready with Trailblazer Connect. It has a simple three-step process. First, skill up by learning in-demand skills on Trailhead. Second, watch these amazing videos for interview tips, resume building tips, and more. And finally, register to a career fair or apply for mentorship. Let's talk about mentorship a little bit. The Trailblazer Mentorship is a program where you get matched one-on-one -on -one with a mentor for 30 days. The mentor then helps the mentee with resume reviews, mock interviews, career planning, and much more. Whether you're looking to find a mentor or be one, apply now. Also, a few sessions on App Exchange gave out tips on how you can build App Exchange products, as well as what kinds of App Exchange products can be used to drive adoption. All the channels had an Ask the Experts session and wrapped up with the amazing True to the Core session. Both of these sessions addressed many important questions from the participants. I encourage all of you to go and check out the recordings, but today in this recap session, we will cover some of them. Satya? Sure, Aditya. The first question is, is Query Builder available today or is it locked in with Code Builder? The answer was, hoping to launch that as VS Code extension probably sometime by the end of this summer. 
And there is another question related to the code builder again. Are there plans to remove the developer console? How does the developer console impact the roadmap for the code builder? And the answer was developer console actively impacts the roadmap for the code builder. And the reason is we want to give you one place to go. If you are on web, that place can be code builder. And if you are on desktop, that can be Visual Studio Code. Dev Console is not going to go away today, but hopefully you may not want to use Dev Console next year. Okay, so the next question, what kind of governor limits are going to apply on Salesforce functions? Functions run outside of the transaction, which means we can give developers a lot more freedom in terms of CPU, memory, and the kind of libraries that they can import into their function. So the ceiling is really the amount of compute that you want to consume and pay for to run your function. The next question is, is setup going to get some love? Features released in Lightning are not often presented in the setup to make them easy to administer. And the answer, we are spending major research effort on how admins are using the tool to make it more effective. Looks like we are right on time, but before we wrap up, Let's listen to our trailblazers once more. TDX was born as a developer conference. I'm always looking for those great new developer announcements. And there was a nice set of them this year. The one I'm most excited about is Code Builder because I used to use Developer Console and I kind of abandoned it for lack of features. But now we sort of have a, a way better new version of Dev Console with Code Builder. I'm excited about the future of our Salesforce ecosystem, be it Salesforce Anywhere, Future Ready LWC and Flows, or all the new developer tools. The way the event was organized and with all the announcements, it's clear that Salesforce is ready for the new normal. What are my key takeaways of Trollhead DX? Well, product announcements and an Really another one, it made me realize that we are very lucky in the Trailblazer community. You know, we can really rely and support each other. And, and you can see this kind of like global love, doesn't matter where we are physically. And that not everybody is as lucky. So we do need to make a conscious effort to remember and reach out to other people around us. Um, this year is really forging history. So for me this year in uh, Trailhead DX, the key takeaways are that there's a lot more developer focus um, with the dev tools that are coming out, the, uh, specifically the code builder, which I think a lot of people are gonna really love. Uh, and also, um, I really like the privacy, data privacy manager, which uh, is a key component to how data is in this world of digital, privacy is everything. And uh, having, um, baking in that feature within the Salesforce uh, platform is really important. It was great seeing them carry on the tradition of the golden hoodie. Uh, so Justin Smith, director of IT at Suncommon, was surprised with the golden hoodie via a package that he opened while on camera. So instead of kind of the on stage surprise, they were able to bring that uh, to the virtual world. The highlight of the event, without a doubt, was true to the core session. Having our favorite leaders answer our questions and talk to us about the future of Salesforce just reaffirmed the love and the trust that goes into everything. My favorite part of the virtual event? Well, the fact that we can come together from all around the world, whatever the weather, and also the DevOps Center, like anything that can help us to bring better Salesforce values sooner, happier, in a safer environment, and we can do that as a team, as a collective, and that's super powerful. So anything that helps us there is awesome. So thank you. I really want to find out more about it. So for me this year in uh, Trailhead DX, the key takeaways are that there's a lot more developer focus um, with the dev tools that are coming out, the, uh, specifically the code builder, which I think a lot of people are gonna really love. Uh, and also, um, I really like the privacy, data privacy manager, which uh, is a key component to how data is in this world of digital, privacy is everything. And uh, having, um, baking in that feature within the Salesforce 
uh, platform is really important. So for me, uh, it is a new way to do business. It is uh, doing business in the new normal as well. Um, so yeah, uh, I really love how these features come together and there's a lot more possibilities opening up uh, for the DevOps and the, the platform management side. So what were your favorite moments and key takeaways from Trailhead DX 2020? Let us know on Twitter using the hashtag TDX20 and feel free to tag both Satya and me. We are excited to see what you loved. Since we had only 45 minutes, we covered topics at a very high level. For more deeper dives, watch the recordings at Trailhead DX website or attend global gatherings that start next week. Thank you, bye-bye, and have a great rest of the year. Thank you.